All right, so this is a big debate tonight. This is going to be four foot walking versus heel strike walking. What is the best approach and what will cause you the least pain in the long run? We got Dr. Todd Martin versus Mark Hendricks. Dr. Todd, we're going to start with you. We're going to go for two minutes. All right. Thanks, Jared. Yeah. So uh, my name is Todd Martin, and I'm a family medicine physician in practice of the last 25 years. I'm also an Argentine tango performer and instructor and a Tai Chi practitioner. And that's how I come to my body movement paradigm. Um, I actually know more about body movement from the Tai Chi and from Tango than from being a doctor. Uh, doctors actually don't do a lot of thought about walking and gait for normal people. They focus primarily on people who have neurological conditions like a, a stroke or multiple sclerosis or a variety of different issues that people can have. They really don't focus on normal people who just walk abnormally and end up with a lot of pain and issues with their feet, with their knees, their hips, and their back. And so I think Mark and I come from the same point of view that a lot of people walk incorrectly and end up getting a variety of different types of pain. Uh, I think we just came from to the wrong, different conclusions on what the issue is. So I still believe that heel strike walking is the way people have always walked historically and should be walking right now. The problem is that people are walking incorrectly with either their heel strike or they're doing other things that are making incorrect posture, um, like anterior pelvic tilt with an arched lower back, uh, walking with duck feet with their feet turned out like that. Those are the primary issues that are causing people to develop so many problems. And what we need to do is teach people how to walk correctly heel first with their feet lined up, with proper posture, with a very soft placement of the foot, and then a controlled change of weight by controlling that with their core in order to walk correctly. And by doing that, they're going to end up with more functional joints and less pain. All right. That is two minutes. Mark, your turn to respond. OK, um, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, people are walking incorrectly. And how I've decided to deal with the uh, approach is from a barefoot perspective. Uh, the presupposition of most, uh, at least clinical trials uh, research is that we were always walking with uh, the heel first. And I believe that is more of a mimicked um, pattern than an actual self review field pattern. And because of that, uh, I use the anatomical structure of the foot and it's the metatarsals and their ability to absorb and the webbing between, just like how we have webbing between our fingers on the palm, because it's not just the fingers that are separated. It is uh, the, the phalanges are separated within the palm of the hand. And the same is uh, for the foot. And I believe that uh, undue striking upon a heel on bare ground is deleterious and it's going to cause uh, long-term problems. And we see that now uh, through the pathologies that we uh, see people have with feet, uh, duck foot walking and, um, you know, plantar fasciitis. The list goes on bunions. Uh, it, it doesn't end. And this is because of the way the that we're walking and because we're walking in this manner of the heel strike that we have now adapted our footwear to kind of mitigate the damage that we're causing. Okay. So, so Mark, your view is that we are now damaging ourselves over the long run by constantly striking our heels against the, uh, the ground. And so modern footwear makers are constantly remedying that by increasing the cushion underneath the heel, which therefore makes people not feel as much pain when they're striking the heel against the ground. But this is obviously setting up them up for long-term damage. 
So Dr. Martin, what would you say as far as when somebody is hitting their heel against the ground constantly, even if they have a cushion underneath their heel, is that sending a shock up their system? Or do you believe that that is something that we don't need to worry about? Yeah, I don't believe that sending a shock up the system if you're placing the foot correctly. You can place very gently on the heel while your root or weight is still on the rear leg. And then you're using your core to control the change of weight in a gradual fashion to your forefoot flat position and then move forward. And to the point of modern footwear, um, we know from fossil records from 3.6 million years ago that our human ancestors walked heel first. We know all great apes walk heel first. It is something that didn't just arise from mimicry from modern footwear. It has existed throughout all of time from our very early ancestors, our, the hominin ancestors, and even before that to the great apes. Heel striking has been the way it's done. That's what the fossil record shows. That's what um, all anthropological research shows that people always walk that way. People studied walking back from um, uh, back from uh, Da Vinci uh, studied walking, Galileo studied walking, Aristotle in 600 or 300 BC studied walking, and nobody describes anything other than heel placement as the normal way humans have ever walked. So you can't blame normal footwear, normal or modern footwear, shoe wear for this. However, Mark is correct that because a lot of people place incorrectly on their heels, they're leaning forward and crashing hard into their heels. The fact that they have the cushioning on their shoes allows them to do that without really feeling the significant repercussions because it's not just the heel impact when you lean forward and push off and land with a very strong heel strike what you're also doing is misaligning your joints where the body weight the center of gravity is going to be towards the insides of your knees insides of your feet insides of your hips and that incorrect weight positioning, not on the tripod of the foot, is going to concentrate all that weight towards the insides of the joints, which is going to collapse the arches, collapse the inside of the knee joint, which is where most people develop their arthritis, and also the inside of the hip joint, which is where people get arthritis. So I think it is not normal heel striking that's the problem. And the research shows it's anywhere from 25% of people end up with chronic knee pain. It is increasing in prevalence over years, over decades since the 1920s. So more people are walking incorrectly now than they used to before. And I think some of that is uh, due to the fact that we keep trying to cushion the issue the wrong way um, with the shoes. But the majority of people go through their entire lives, and I know many of my patients who are in their 80s and 90s walk heel strike. Every single person in the world practically walks with a heel strike, and they don't all end up with knee pain or plantar fasciitis. It's a minority of people who do. That minority is growing, unfortunately, because people are starting to walk with a more dysfunction, dysfunctional way. But throughout humanity, people have always walked heel strike heal first without having many issues. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. You know, my dad, he walks heel, uh, he doesn't walk with the heel strike. My mom walks with the heel strike and they don't have any knee pain or ankle pain. So you believe that our, our the natural foot strike is a, a light, a light tap of the heel and then the rest of the foot follows forward. So it, it, that, and that's uh, different than somebody slamming their heel on the ground when they're wearing padded shoes. So Mark, do you think that the subtle tap of the heel, is that deleterious to the overall structure of the, um, the leg? No, if, if you're talking about in terms of a stroll, and I think this is where I've, I've always said this, um, if you're walking from the kitchen to uh, your family room and you're using a heel strike, right? A gentle walk, uh, it's fine, it, it, it is okay. Like no one, uh, I, I have not seen anyone suffer from that. In terms of what I'm talking about uh, is walking with the intention of exercise. And Tai Chi teaches motor patterns or at least motor control. 
And that soft touch on the heel strike is not at a pace that someone would normally walk in a bustling city. Uh, they're going to walk with a faster pace, and then that's going to incur a harder strike. Um, to touch down uh, in uh, a Tai Chi manner uh, is a softer, more uh, focused and mindful approach. And that is also why those same practitioners also walk backwards uh, as a therapeutic uh, practice because the heel striking um, is overall is gonna add up because the, the, the biggest issue that I have with the heel strike, not, not that I have personally, what will happen is that the calcaneus can evert and invert. And it's a small degree, but it is still pronounced, especially when you're doing 10,000 plus steps a day. The calcaneus inverts only on two positions, in full plantar flexion and in full dorsiflexion. Those are the two end ranges. Without that, the talus joint uh, keeps it everted uh, until it reaches either of those extremes of which it, then it will invert and come towards that midline, that center line in our body. The more that you practice landing with an everted heel is the more damage to other aspects of your foot and your gait pat, um, upstream uh, from that gait pattern that you'll cause. Gotcha. When, so you need the, the pronation and the, and the supination of the foot, and then also the, the toes, they need to be able to splay out. And so when they hit the ground, um, so all the force went, so when you are walking on your forefoot, um, it seems that the force, it is distributed throughout the entire foot, as opposed to when you are hitting the ground, even if it's subtle with the heel, it seems that the force is localized to the area and then you kind of roll onto the foot. So is there a difference between that and for instance, say your elbow, if you're hitting your elbow on the ground or versus your entire, um, your entire forearm, would, would you say that there's a difference in the fact that the heel is designed to take that impact? Yeah, I, I would definitely say there's a difference because the heel is designed for that. And the heel has a thick fat pad over it that we evolved over millions of years that allow it to be perfectly situated for landing on the heel. Again, not leaning forward and pounding into the heel, but landing normally. And then when you control your movement correctly from the core, it controls the amount of pronation that you're doing and it keeps the foot lined up in the proper positioning. So by the time your full weight is on the foot, you have the entire tripod on the foot. When your foot first hits the ground, your weight is really on the rear leg at that point. And so then you're gradually transferring the weight as you use your abs to transfer your spine directly over the new standing leg. And that is a gradual process that occurs using our lower abs and our upper abs and our hip actions. So by the time your full load is on the foot, the weight is evenly distributed, the forefoot can splay out like it should, and you have the proper weight distribution so everything is lined up correctly. And I, I would just say that, I mean, we already, we know from evidence that humans have always walked this way. So there has to be some really great uh, need or drive for us to throw out what humans have been doing forever. And the fact that 25 to 30% of people end up getting knee pain, which can easily be explained by the people who visibly walk incorrectly on their heels or duck footed, uh, the fact that more than half of people live their entire lives without having any issue would seem to argue against the fact that what everybody is doing is incorrect. If what everybody was doing was incorrect when they went out walking, if our military soldiers who hike 50 miles or more, who all use a heel strike in every single army in the world, if they were all doing something wrong, uh, that would be really deleterious for these people who have to march and march and march and march when in a war, uh, the end, ending up with foot problems uh, would be fatal. And so that would be something that other people, we would have already recognized if the heel strike was the problem and every military soldier heel strikes, uh, we would know that this is the problem uh, before now. 
Okay, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, there are tons of people that are definitely not in pain um, that heal strike. I would, I would say that there are a lot of military soldiers that do get shin splints and other uh, overuse injuries. Um, Mark, would you say that that is caused by heel striking? Yeah, well, okay. Uh, first, there we have a few cultures that have walked forefoot. Um, Japanese culture, samurai, they actually have a forefoot shoe that just covers the front metatarsal pads. And it's, um, it has a, a slipper type thong uh, setting to it. And people are trying to reemerge that back into the culture now. Uh, and uh, I, f I forgot the company, but that exists. So that is proof. Uh, samurai and uh, ancient uh, Japanese people were using a four foot shoe, something that only covered the front, uh, the forefoot of the foot. And they were not heel striking. There'd be no reason to just cover or protect the front if they were landing on the heel. So, uh, so there is evidence of people four foot striking. Uh, what we don't have and truly don't have is evidence of people being witnessed walking in the wild without any sort of uh, interaction with who is actually witnessing them, who's observing them. So because of that, there's a lot of alter a lot of mimicking happens. And because of that, we've, we're not really getting a chance to see people on their own without the influence of the observer and seeing how they would normally move. It is, as a person who comes from an environment that is very uh, rough on, on the ground and has you know, different items that you could damage your foot on, it would be uh, very um, hard, uh, it'd be very hard to land on hard gravel with your heel or a small pebbles. It's not gonna happen. And again, we are talking uh, from pushing forward on the heel uh, in a smooth, gentle manner into a more realistic or higher pace uh, walking, which is what most people do in the cities. You can imagine back uh, in prehistoric era or whatever era you want to say that was earlier than now, that people were living a more intense life, a more purposeful life and if they weren't evading something they were tracking something down and through that they would have no chance to really relax upon a heel and then roll over these people are pacing they're they're actually pursuing or evading so that requires a higher level of performance as to the soldiers Soldiers are notorious or if you ask any soldier they'll tell you that these boots hurt in fact we we're finding that as the heel progresses in, in height, that we're having more complaints. And at no point, since everybody knows that we walk on our heels and everyone is doing it and it's perfectly fine, for some reason, the, the thickness of the heel seems to be getting larger and larger, even though we all know how to walk on our heels. For some reason, we're doing we are trying to mitigate the damage that's being caused. People are complaining, and that is why they're coming up with more cushion uh, as the answer. And not only are they doing that, they've, we've all, always known what the shape of a foot is, yet for some reason, all of the shoes that are conventionally manufactured have this narrow toe box that is the antithesis of what the foot needs. In fact, a, the foot needs a foot-shaped toe box. And up to now, even though we all see the anatomical structures, we all have the diagrams, yet we are all wearing shoes. We're all complicit in this, wearing shoes that do not fit the feet, whether in athletics or for high fashion. So to say that we are doing something because we've always done it, and yet we're now catching ourselves doing this, this um this backwards behavior, fitting our, forcing our feet into these things as per normal. And we see what normal gets us, a lot of injury. Right, it seems like also when you're walking on the forefoot, it seems to be easy to transition into a run. So Dr. Yes. Martin, do you think that that is, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, well, I'm not going to, first of all, defend the shoe companies, because I, I do think the sort of shoes they're designing are not uh, appropriate for what the problems people have, for the reasons I already mentioned. People who heel strike incorrectly and just cushioning that more and more and more is not helping the problem. Uh, I'm very much in favor of people learning how to walk barefoot, walking in minimalist shoes so they can really feel the ground underneath them. But if you, you can find videos on YouTube of African tribes, people in South America, people who walk habitually barefoot out on the savanna and in, in the plains, and they're all walking with a heel strike, uh, no matter how uh, non-modern the culture is, uh, the, these people, if you can find them on video, they're all still walking with a heel strike. And as I mentioned before, the fossil evidence it indicates that we have always been walking with a heel strike. And so that is just what we kind of know from anthropology um, from that evidence. And so the problem with the shoe companies and the way some people are walking is a real thing. But people walk, uh, and I'll, let me get to this, uh, when we talk about people having to hunt and walk across the plains of Africa when humanity first was uh, arrived on this planet or evolved on this planet, you had to walk very efficiently, burning very few calories in order to hunt your food and survive. And the studies all show that walking heel first is far more energetically efficient than walking forefoot first. It, the study, a study from the University of Utah showed that walking forefoot first or midfoot first on the ball or on the landing on the ball is 53% more energy required than landing on the heel. And so if primitive man was trying to hunt food, walking on their forefoot and then retrograding back onto their heel, that's a very inefficient way to move if you're trying to expend less calories and move quicker. You can move much faster walking on your heel and using the kinetic energy that you're rolling forward with onto the forefoot as you continue to cycle through each step. It is far more efficient than walking either midfoot or forefoot. And so for our ancestors where that was critical for survival, it would have made no sense to walk on the plains walking on the forefoot. And as to walking on pebbles, studies show that people develop thick calluses very quickly when they're walking barefoot um, outside. And those calluses are very sufficient to have handled any sort of pebbles, thorns, twigs, things people would have walked on um, back before modern uh, concrete uh, was invented. So people who are our ancestors would have very easily been able to navigate uh, jungles, forests, grasslands, landing on pebbles and stuff like that with a calloused heel, a calloused forefoot, and the heel pad that's already underneath there. Uh, stepping on pebbles and stuff like that, or even thorns, would not have been an issue. So, Mark, do you think that that the trade-off of having a more efficient gait, do you think that having a more efficient gait is a good trade-off for having a more um, a, a gate that causes less damage because it seems like a four-foot walk causes less damage in your mind but Dr. Martin is saying that the it's more efficient to use a slight heel strike so what would you say do you think that's a good trade-off okay well it, uh, Dr. Martin said that it was the faster way so it can't be both it can't be efficient and the fastest way if it's um, preserving energy uh, the the idea first that the fossils are evidence of the gait pattern, uh, I don't think is sufficient. I think it just shows placement of the foot on the ground. It doesn't show how the foot was placed on the ground. We don't know in what condition uh, or what activity people were when we're talking about these fossils. So I try not to go into that. Uh, what I will say is this, when it comes to the foot developing heavy calluses, that's untrue. The foot actually does not. Um, calluses are evidence of friction and improperly when you're holding a barbell when you're doing anything in an improper manner for too long or let me not say improper but not in the best manner you will develop calluses because it's a frictional um issue if that were the case people would have these calluses already on their heels yet they don't what we're finding is that people when they're walking uh use all of the musculature to walk and therefore, it is more efficient in that manner. 
Yes, the fact that you are four foot walking already will allow you to reach a higher speed. Um, also, will you heel strike when carrying a load? Not really. If you see most strong men competitions, when they're pulling the truck, they don't land on their heel. So it's not gonna help you actually pull or carry anything either. Yes, you can default or rely on landing on the heel for occasions, but in terms of uh, evasion, uh, pursuing, no, there's, um, there's no reason to land on the heel first. And in fact, it would only cause you to be caught or for you to be unable to catch what you were trying to catch. Because if you're doing something like persistent hunt, uh, persistence hunting, uh, the idea that you're going to lazily uh, rock the foot forward because it's more efficient in order to um, chase down an animal or to at least exhaust it, wouldn't be as applicable as a four foot walk would, which would allow you to keep a, a, a springer, um, a more athletic pace, and also without, um, how do you say it? It would just allow you to, to keep pace. That's the best way to put it. Now, um, I forgot the other point uh, Dr. Martin said, but uh, when it comes time to, if what, if heel striking was doing <laughs> or was effective or more efficient, people would find a way to walk as fast as they could with that heel strike. And what we have from that is the sport of speed walking. And we see that they have a, a high non-contact injury within the hips because there is you can only walk so fast with trying to land the heel first. Again, this the a mindful heel strike in the matter that a Tai Chi practitioner would perform, I don't believe is conducive to the lifestyle of even our sedentary lifestyle, much less um, earlier times. Yeah, yeah let me sense. just jump in um, for a couple of points. So first on the Tai Chi, Tai Chi walking is not the same as normal walking. Tai Chi walking does place on the heel, but when you walk in Tai Chi, all of your body weight is placed over your standing leg and then you reach out and place on the heel and then you transfer. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. meant for traveling, it's meant for fighting. Uh, so that's, yes. so we, yeah, so that, that's not how people walk normally, but when we walk normally, we're walking for efficiency. You said that you can't walk fast and that be efficient at the same time. Speed, the efficiency is measured by how much energy you're burning to travel a certain amount of distance. And what they find with studies is that you burn less or need less energy walking a certain distance on the heel than you do if you're going to be placing on the midfoot or the forefoot. It's less efficient to place on the midfoot or forefoot, which is why it takes more energy to place on the midfoot or forefoot. That wouldn't be good for people who were trying to hunt for a living. And then we also know humans are great runners also, long distance runners. So when we're trying to move quickly, we would gradually would transfer immediately from the heel strike walking, which can get you to a certain pace. It doesn't get you to a running pace. So uh, for Olympic speed walkers, race walkers, they're using a, a very different walking style to try to get a running pace from walking. Uh, part of the rules of speed walking is, or race walking is you have to have both feet on the ground at one point in time, which is, defines the difference between walking and running. But if somebody's walking and trying to run to hunt for efficiency, they're going to eventually go from a quick walking pace to a running pace. And with running, um, it is quite natural for people who are very good, uh, efficient runners to land on midfoot or forefoot. That's a very different technique than walking. So uh, when we walk in different circumstances, we also place differently. When we walk downstairs, we do naturally place on the forefoot. That's just the nature. It's like when you're riding a bike and you push down, your toes are gonna point down. That's the nature of that movement when you push down, different than when we, you reach forward with the leg. So there are times when people will place on the forefoot walking, and then certainly when they're running, placing on the forefoot is quite normal. Uh, you can respond, Mark. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, in regards to the switch or the pattern switch from heel striking to uh, four or four foot running, up until I think it was late um, 90s or early 2000s, we were told that we weren't supposed to do four foot run either. And so that was a huge deliberation between uh, four foot and the supposed midfoot walking, which doesn't really exist. Uh, you can say that you're landing your foot as flat as possible or trying to land with the heel and the metatarsal pads at the same time. But in truth, uh, not many people are able to actually do that. And these same people who say that they're landing on the midfoot also are wearing conventional shoes that are not zero drop nor have um, a thin heel, I mean, thin sole. So that is a, a, a more of a subjective account of what they're doing. In terms of now that people are coming to accept four foot uh, running, suddenly, I think you're gonna have the same uh, issue right now with people understanding that you lean forward uh, to walk at a high pace and that you land on your forefoot. Uh, it's just uh, it's it, it is just how this mechanism works. This uh, idea of adoption of what seems like otherworldly when it was practical to begin with. The idea that your feet actually or the, your um, your metatarsals actually have uh, muscles like the uh, hallucis adductors. Those actually help to keep the metatarsals from uh, splaying too far uh, apart and to actually rebound. That's why we have a transverse arch. The reason for the transverse arch is to land upon, to allow for that dissipation of force. Now, yes, could you land on your heel? Yes, but you can also handstand walk on the heel of your um, wrist also, but people who practice um, handstand racing like CrossFit don't do that. They depend on the splay of the toe um, of the fingers to absorb that impact because after a while it will hurt. And by handstand racing, we're not talking about fast speeds. We're talking about the same pace that um, is exhibited by heel strike walk. And because of our sensitivity to our hands, you see, the reason why most people are claiming not to have any issues with their, their feet is because we treat the feet as clubs. Very few people can actually um, use toes uh, as they do their fingers. It's very rare and you have the ability and no one seems to be able to exhibit that, uh, at least not in a, a mass scale. I'd say it's, a, well, a very small percentage. And that shows you that this lack of, or this, this kind of, um, how do you say this, um, peg leg um, outlook on the foot is the problem. If you're just landing on a stump, then you're gonna lack the dexterity to do many other things. The heel striking keeps you in a mode of which you're confined, not only by the shoes, but through the, the movement of the foot, you do not develop foot dexterity. There is no one who's walking with a forefoot strike now who does not have the ability to at least uh, display flexion of their big toe independently from their remaining toes. And some even go further to have um, full articulation individually. So it, we're talking about overall health and performance is increased from practicing a forefoot strike. All right. Yeah. So. Um... I got to go in 10 minutes, but I mm -hmm. definitely, so uh, Dr. Martin, um, what, so with the heel striking, um, let's see. So when you're walking on your forefoot, it seems like just in my opinion, it seems like you're using your foot as, as a spring and it seems like you're absorbing all the impacts like easier, but what would you say that the disadvantages to forefoot walking would be? Yeah, so number one, um, if you're going to be forefoot walking, then you're going to be placing on the forefoot and then retrograding back to the heel. So you're actually moving less efficiently because you're actually not moving forward the whole time. Instead of rolling forward, you're actually moving your foot backwards as you're trying to move your body forward. 
So that is much less efficient. It also places a lot of stress on the anterior tibialis in the front of the leg and the, of the, the, the lower leg when you're trying to lower your forefoot to the ground. And so people can get strains when doing that. Um, it's also mainly just that it's less efficient. I'm not saying you, you could probably walk around forefoot relatively slowly all day long. You're going to burn a lot more energy doing that. Um, and it's not, I think, going to help you get more healthy. Uh, people can end up with strains of their muscles. It may not be impact strains, but they're going to be having overuse strains because you are going to be using certain muscles a lot more. It's going to take a lot more work when you're trying to walk forefoot. So people who are trying to change to a forefoot walk can end up getting pain doing that. Plus, it's just really not solving the problem that you're trying to fix. If you're trying to fix the problem of developing pain from walking, then I think it's best that you change to the normal pattern of walking that people should be doing. Not everybody walks normally, but trying to change that throughout the entire paradigm of heel strike walking, which is universal. And like I said, even the great apes heel strike when they walk bipedally, uh, throwing that out, I think is the wrong solution for a problem that does exist. Oh, and just uh, to go back to the, um, I think Mark, you made a point about um, running and oh, the, the controversy. And there's still controversy about there about whether you develop pain from either heel striking or midfoot or forefoot striking, which is the better for injury prevention. I think the research out there on that is still questionable. It's, it's not showing uh, a, a, direct, a direct connection between one or the other. Uh, people who are running regardless of how they run, end up getting injuries. Uh, but that I think is not the, the fundamental um, issue. So people who, if you watch competitive runners, they're running, I think the speed is more indicative of how people are gonna land. People who run very slowly are generally gonna land on their heel. People who are much more competitive runners and are running more long distance uh, and using muscular, more muscular force are gonna be landing on their forefeet. And people like Usain Bolt who are sprinting uh, because it's a very different mechanical cycle of a rapid circulation of the legs, rapid cycling. Uh, when you're sprinting, uh, you're gonna be landing on your forefoot. And I talk in some of my videos about the mechanical differences between either heel strike midfoot strike or forefoot strike running. They're all very mechanically different. Whether they're one's better than the other, I'm agnostic on, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a runner, um, but uh, there, you can do either one of those, but you can't walk forefoot first and be very efficient at doing it. It's just gonna be a lot slower and it's gonna take you a lot more energy to do it. And it's just, to my other earlier point, it's just not gonna fix the problem you're trying to solve. It seems that uh, in, so Mark, would you say that Dr. Martin, he's saying that you land on like your foot, like you're rocking backwards, mm -hmm. but I think I saw one of your videos, you were saying that it's actually more of like a, you're landing on the outside edge of the foot and then it mm -hmm. kind of relaxes inward and that when you hang your foot naturally off of a ledge, that's the position that it's naturally in. And so it seems like you're impacting the force in a natural way. Um, like, would you say that that is different than like landing on your tiptoes and then rocking backwards? Yeah, um, that is not how uh, you'd forefoot walk. Uh, what is happening is that you're landing on the forefoot, you're landing on the metatarsal pads and through the suspension mechanism of your Achilles, you are then creating a spring whether you land fully or place full pressure upon the heel, which I don't do, or nor do I promote, um, that's up to the individual, but that is not in the process in how you would walk. Um, as for the undue tension on the tibialis anterior or even the posterior, uh, yet I, we know that the tibialis is highly underdeveloped, highly underused. In fact, uh, Ben Patrick has a whole uh, system on trying to build up the tibialis through using tibialis raises because they are so deficient. Why? Because we're heel striking. Though I think efficiency is using all the components that you have towards the method, not picking a few or cutting off uh, certain muscles in order to just 
uh, cut down energy usage. I think of energy uh, usage is displaced throughout the body in a more balanced manner, that is more efficient. That allows you to pull from different sources, different uh, glyco uh, glycogen sources within these muscles are allowed to um, integrate into this movement. Heel striking doesn't allow for that. So yeah, if you look at the Jacqueline Perry's book on, on normal walking, which is I think the gold standard, uh, she describes uh, the use of basically all of the muscles in the legs when you're walking. Well, so you're that's not, that, that doesn't have the tibialis anterior in it. it does. And, so, and, and the idea of having an overuse of a muscle when there is no such thing as an overuse of a specific muscle. Four foot walking does not increase calf strength. It does none of those things. What it, it does, it disperses impact. And that is the, the problem that people are having with walking. And that's why they're making so many deviations in their gait is to divert the pain that they're, uh, um, that they're going through when trying to do the standard um, version, the heel strike. And so because of that, they have to deviate. That's why they have the duck foot. They have the duck foot because when they land and because of the trajectory of uh, their heel and the pain that they collapse inwards. The reason why we have our support in the shoes is to mitigate the pain from the heel or, or from the, the lack of inversion from the calcaneus. Because if the calcaneus inverts and you land upon that, you're gonna feel that shudder. And so all these mechanisms, whether it's the arch support, the toe spring, not to mention also, we didn't mention that your use of the windless mechanism, which is a substantial reflex in terms of our gait cycle is non-existent because of the, not only the design of our shoes, but are dependent on the heel strike method. Because of that, we don't even, many People don't even know what the windless mechanism is. And that it cannot be engaged unless the toes are an extension. And you cannot get an extension through the heel strike walking. At least we don't see people um, doing that because- yeah, I, Let me just jump mm -hmm. in, because I'll say number one, the anterior tibialis and all of the muscles in the front of the leg are used in walking. They're used eccentrically when we're doing a loading response, when the leg is coming down and they're used concentrically during the first part of mid swing as the tibia moves forward over the foot. So we are using those muscles. We're using the muscles in the posterior of the lower leg and the upper leg. Uh, what I think they do a poor job of describing is how we're using our core muscles, uh, our abdominal musculature um, in walking. They don't describe that very well. And I do a lot of that description in my videos. Uh, the windless mechanism was described for heel strike walking. So, you know, we're using the windless mechanism to support the arch as we walk. And then when we do the, um, the heel off or the heel rise portion of the gait, the windless mechanism is gonna be in place. So all of these things are consistent with heel strike walking. Very interesting. That was a great debate for sure. Both of you guys are extremely knowledgeable in both of your fields, forefoot walking and heel strike walking. And, you know, even though we have our differences in opinion, um, hopefully people will take something out of this uh, podcast and figure out what works best for them. So, yeah. Thanks for having us, Jared. And thanks, Mark. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Martin. All right. Cool. Thanks, Jared. All right. See you guys. Okay.